Book 6 of the Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kubar Wolfsky. The Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus by Marcus Aurelius. Translated by George Crystal, 1888-1944. Book 6. The substance of the universe is docile and pliable. The mind which governs it has in itself no source of evil doing. It has no malice, it does no ill, and nothing is hurt by it. By its guidance all things come to be and fulfill their being. Act the part which is worthy of you, regarding not whether you be stiff with cold or comfortably warm, whether you be drowsy or refreshed with sleep, whether you be in good report or bad whether you be dying, or upon some other business, for death also is one piece of the business of life. And, here as elsewhere, it is enough to do well what comes to our hand. Look within, let not the proper quality or value of anything escape you. All that exists will very speedily change, by rarefaction, if all substance be one, otherwise by dispersion. The guiding mind knows what its own condition is, how and upon what matter its work is done. The best revenge is not to copy him that wronged you. Find your sole delight and recreation in proceeding from one unselfish action to another, with God ever in mind. The ruling part of you is that which rouses and steers itself making itself what it wishes to be, and making all that happens take such appearance as it will. All things are accomplished according to the will of universal nature. There is no other nature to influence them which either comprehends the former from without, or is contained within it, or exists externally and independent of it. The universe is either a confusion, raveled and unraveled again, or else a unity compact of order and forethought. If it be the former, why should I wish to linger amid this aimless chaos and confusion, or have any further care than how to become earth again? Nay, why am I disturbed at all? This solution will overtake me, do what I please. But if the latter be the case, I adore the ruler of all things, I stand firm and put my trust in him. Whenever your situation forces trouble upon you, return quickly to yourself, and interrupt the rhythm of life no longer than you are compelled. Your grasp of the harmony will grow surer by continual recurrence to it. Had you at one time both a stepmother and a mother, you would respect the former, yet you would be more constantly in your mother's company. Your court and your philosophy a stepmother and mother to you. Return then frequently to your true mother and recreate yourself with her. Her consolation can make the court seem bearable to you and you to it. Keep these thoughts for meats and eatables. This that is before me is the dead carcass of a fish, a fowl, a hog. This falerian is but a little grape juice. Think of your purple robes as sheep's wool stained in the blood of a shellfish. Such conceptions, which touch reality so near, and set forth the sum and substance of these objects, are powerful indeed to display to us their despicable value. In this spirit we should act throughout life, and when things of great apparent worth present themselves, we should strip them naked, view their meanness, and cast aside the glowing description which makes them seem so glorious. Vanity is a great sophist, and most imposes on us when we believe ourselves to be busy about the noblest ends. Remember the saying of Crates about Xenocrates himself. Most objects of vulgar admiration may be referred to certain general classes. There are first those which hold together by cohesion or by some organic unity, such as stone, 
timber, figs, vines or olives. The things which men a shade more reasonable admire are referred to the class which possesses animal life, such as is seen in flocks and herds. When man's taste is still more cultured, his admiration turns to things which can show a rational intelligence. But he admires this intelligence not as a universal principle, but only so far as he finds it expressed in art or industry, or indeed sometimes merely so far as it is exhibited by his retinue of artist slaves. But he who values rational intelligence as a universal thing and as a social force will care nothing for these other objects of admiration. He will, above all things, strive to preserve his own mind in all its rational and social instincts and activities, and to this end he will cooperate with any of his kind. Some things hasten into being, some hasten to be no more. Even as a thing is born, some part of it is already dead. Flux and change are constantly renewing the world, just as the unbroken flow of time ever presents to us some new portion of eternity. In this vast river, on whose bosom there is no tarrying, what is there among the things that sweep by us that is worth the prizing? It is as if a man grew fond of one among a passing flight of sparrows, when already it had vanished from his sight. Our life itself is much like a vapor of the blood, or a drawing in of air. Our momentary actions of inhalation and exhalation are one in kind with that whole power of breathing which, yesterday and the day before, we received at birth, and which we must restore again to the source from whence we drew it. It is a small privilege to transpire like plants, or even to breathe as cattle or wild beasts do, to feel the impressions of sense, to be swayed like puppets by passion, to herd together and to live by bread. All this is no great thing. There is nothing here superior to our power of discharging our superfluous food. What then is of value? To be received with clapping of hands? No. Neither, therefore, is the applause of tongues more valuable, for the praises of the multitude are not by the idle clapping of tongues. Dismiss the vanity called fame, and what remains to be prized? This, I think, in all things to act, or to restrain yourself from action, as best suits the particular structure of your nature. This is the end of all arts and studies, for every art aims at making what it produces well adapted to the work for which it was designed. The gardener, the vine dresser, the horse breaker, the dog trainer, all try for this. And what else is the aim of all education and teaching? Here then is what you may truly value. This well won, you will seek nothing more. Will you then cease valuing the multitude of other things? If you do not, you will never attain to freedom, self-sufficiency, or tranquillity. You cannot escape envying, suspecting, and striving against those who have the power to deprive you of your cherished objects, nor plotting against men who are in possession of that on which you set your heart. The man who lacks any of these things must of necessity be distracted, and be forever complaining against the gods. But reverence and respect for your own intelligence will bring you to agreement with yourself, into concord with mankind and into harmony with the gods, whom you will praise for all their good gifts and guidance. Upward, downward, round and round, round the courses of the elements. But the course of virtue is like none of these. It follows a diviner path, well directed in a way that is hard for us to understand. Strange are the ways of men. They can speak no good word of the contemporaries with whom they live, yet they count it a great thing to gain the praises of a posterity whom they never saw nor shall see. As well might we grieve because we cannot hear the praises of our ancestors. If a thing seems to you very difficult to accomplish, conclude not that it is beyond human power. But if you see that anything is within man's power, and part of his proper work, 
conclude that you also may attain to it. In the gymnasium, if someone scratches us with his nails, or in a sudden onset bruises our head, we express no resentment. We are not offended, nor do we suspect him for the future as one who is plotting against us. We are on our guard against him, it is true, but not as against an enemy or a suspected person. In all good humor, we simply keep out of his way. Let us thus behave in other affairs of life, and overlook the many injuries which are done to us, as it were, by our antagonists in the gymnasium of the world. As I said, we may keep out of their way, but without suspicion or hatred. If anyone can convince or show me that I am wrong in thought or deed, I will gladly change. It is truth that I seek, and truth never yet hurt any man. What does hurt is persistence in error or in ignorance. I do my duty, and for the rest am not distracted by anything which is inanimate or irrational, or which has lost or ignores the proper way. Use the brute creation, and also all material things, in the spirit of magnanimity and freedom, which becomes him who has reason in using that which has it not. Towards men, who have reason, act in a social spirit. In every business, call the gods to aid thee, nor trouble how long this business shall endure. Three hours spent therein may suffice you. Alexander of Macedon and his muleteer, when they died, were in a like condition. They were either alike resumed into the seminal source of all things, or alike dispersed among the atoms. Consider all the many things, both physical and spiritual, that are doing within each of us at the very same instant of time, and you will wonder the less at the far greater multitudes of things even all that is, which exists together in the one and all, which we call the universe. Should someone ask you how the name Antoninus is written, would you not carefully pronounce to him each one of the letters? Should he then begin an angry dispute about it, would you also grow angry, and not rather mildly count over the several letters to him? Thus in life remember that each duty is made up of a number of elements. We should observe all these calmly, and, without anger at those who are angry with us, we should set about accomplishing the task which lies before us. Is it not cruel to restrain men from pursuing what appears to be their own advantage? And yet, in a manner, you deny them this liberty when you show anger at their errors. Men are assuredly attracted to what seems to be their own advantage. Yes, you say, but it is not their advantage. Instruct them, then, and make this evident to them, but without anger. Death is the cessation of the sensual impressions, of the impulses of the passions, of the questionings of reason, and of the servitude to the flesh. It is shame and dishonor that in any man's life the soul should faint from its duty while the body still holds out. See to it that you fall not into Caesarism. Avoid that stain, for it may come to you. Guard your simplicity, your goodness, your sincerity, your dignity, your reticence, your love of justice, your piety, your kindliness, your affection for your kin, and your constancy to your duty. Endeavor earnestly to continue such as philosophy would make you. Reverence the gods and help mankind. Life is short, and the one fruit of it in this world is a pure mind and unselfish conduct. Be in all things the disciple of Antonine. Imitate his resolute constancy to rational action, his level equability, his godliness his serenity of countenance, his sweetness of temper, his content of vainglory, his keen attempts to comprehend things. 
remember how he never quitted any subject till he had thoroughly examined it and understood it, and how he bore with those who blamed him unjustly without making any angry retort, how he was never in a hurry, how he discouraged calumny, how closely he scanned the manners and actions of men, how cautious he was in reproaching any man, how free from fear, suspicion or sophistry, how little contented him in the matter of house, furniture, dress, food, servants, how patient he was of labor, and how slow to anger. So abstemious was his life that he could hold out until evening without relieving himself except at the usual hour. What a firm and loyal friend he was, how patient of frank opposition to his opinions, how glad if any one could set him right, how religious he was, and yet how free from superstition. Follow in his steps, that your last hour may find you with a conscience as easy as his. Sober yourself, recall your senses, shake sleep from you and know that it was a dream that troubled you, and, now that you are broad awake again, regard the waking world as you did the dream. I am made up of a frail body and a soul. To the body all things are indifferent, because it cannot distinguish them. And to the mind, all things are indifferent also, which arise not from its own activities. All these are indeed in its own power, but it is concerned with only such of them as are present. Its past and future activities are indifferent to it now. No toil for hand or foot is against nature so long as it is proper for hand or foot to do. No more, then, is toil contrary to the nature of man as man, so long as he is doing work appointed for a man to do. And if it be not contrary to his nature, it cannot be evil for him. How many are the pleasures that have been enjoyed by robbers, rakes, parasites, and tyrants? Do you not see how common artificers though they may humor the public to a certain extent, cling to the rules of their art, and cannot endure to depart from them. Is it not grievous, then, that the architect and the physician should show greater respect for the rules of their several professions than man shows for his own reason, which he possesses in common with the gods? Asia and Europe are mere corners of the universe. The whole sea is but a drop, Athos, a clod. All the present is but an instant in eternity. All things are small, changeable, and fleeting. Everything proceeds from the universal intelligence, either directly or as a consequence. Thus the jaws of lions, poisons, all evil things such as thorns or mire, are the consequences of the grand and the beautiful. Do not then imagine that they are foreign to that which you revere, but consider well the source of all things. He who has seen the present has seen all that either has been from all eternity or will be to all eternity, for all things are alike in kind and form. Consider frequently the connection of all things in the universe and their relation to each other. All things are in a manner intermingled with one another and are, therefore, mutually friendly. For one thing comes in due order after another, by virtue of local movements, and of the harmony and unity of the whole. Adapt yourself to the things which your destiny has given you. Love those with whom it is your lot to live, and love them with sincere affection. A tool, an instrument, a utensil, is in good case when it is fit for its proper work, yet its maker remains not by it. But within the organisms of nature, there remains and resides the power which made them. You ought, therefore, to reverence this power the more, believing that if you act in deference to its will, all will happen to you in reason, for so in reason the universe ranges all. Whenever we imagine that anything which lies not in our power is good or evil for us, if the evil befall us, or if we miss the good, 
we inevitably blame the gods and hate the men who are, or whom we suspect to be, the cause of our disaster or our loss. Our solicitude about such things leads to much injustice. But if we judge only the things that are in our power to be good or evil, there is no reason left for accusing the gods or for hating men. We are all cooperating in one great work, some with knowledge and understanding, others ignorantly and without design. It is in this sense, I think, that Heraclitus says that men are working even while they sleep, working together in all that is being done in the universe. Each works in a different way, and even those contribute abundantly, who murmur and try to oppose and to frustrate the course of nature. The world has need even of such as these. It remains then for you to make sure which is the class in which you rank yourself. The presiding mind will assuredly use you to good purpose one way or another, and will enlist you among its laborers and fellow workers. But see to it that the part that falls to you lie not in the vulgar comic passage of the play of which Chrysippus has spoken. Does the sun pretend to perform the work of the rain, or Esculapius that of Ceres? What of the several stars? Are they not different, yet all jointly working for the same end? If the gods took counsel about me, and what should befall me, doubtless then counsel was good. It is difficult to imagine gods wanting in forethought, and what could move them to do me willful harm? What advantage would then accrue? either to themselves or to the universe, which is their special care. If they have not taken counsel about me in particular, they certainly have done so about the common interests of the universe, and I therefore should accept cheerfully and contentedly the fate which is the outcome of their ordinance. If indeed they take no counsel about anything, which it were impious to believe, then let us quit our sacrifices, our prayers and our oaths, and all acts of devotion which we now perform, as if they lived and moved amongst us. But granting that the gods take no thought for my affairs, I am still deliberate about myself. It is my business to consider my own interest. Now, each man's interest is that which agrees with the structure of his nature, and my nature is rational and social. As Antoninus, my city and my country is Rome. As a human being, it is the world. That alone, then, which profits these two cities, can profit me. All that happens to the individual is of profit to the whole. This would suffice. But if you consider closely, you will see that it is also a general truth that all that happens to one man is of profit to the rest of mankind. Profit here should be taken in a somewhat general sense as referring to things indifferent. In the amphitheater and other such resorts the same or similar spectacles continually presented, cloy at last. It is even so in all our experience of life. All things, first and last, are alike and like derived. When shall the end be? Think continually of all the men that are dead and gone, men of every sort and condition, of all manner of pursuits and of every nation, return back to Philistian, Phoebus and Origanian, passed down to other generations of the dead. We must all change our habitation and go to that place where there are so many great orators, so many venerable philosophers, Heraclitus, Pythagoras, Socrates, and so many heroes have gone before, and so many generals and princes have followed. Add to these Eudoxus, Hipparchus, Archimedes, another keen, great, laborious, cunning, and arrogant spirits. Yea, such as have wittily derided this fading mortal life, which is but for a day, as did Menippus and his brethren. Consider that all these are long since in their graves, and wherein here is the harm for them, or even for men whose names are not remembered. The one precious thing in life is to spend it in a steady course of truth and justice, with kindliness, even for the false and the unjust. When you would cheer your heart, consider the several excellencies of those that live around you. Consider the activity of one, the modesty of another, the generosity of a third, 
and the other virtues of the rest. Nothing rejoices the heart so much as instances, the more the better, of goodness manifested in the characters of those around us. Let us therefore have such instances ever present for reflection. Are you grieved that you weigh only these few pounds and not three hundred? If not, is there greater reason to sorrow if you live only so many years and no longer? You are satisfied with your allotted quantity of matter. Content yourself then likewise with the span of time appointed you. Try to persuade men to agree with you. But whether they agree or not, pursue the course you have marked out when the principle of justice point that way. Should one oppose you by force, act with resignation, and show not that you are hurt, use the obstruction for the exercise of some other virtue, and remember that your purpose involved the reservation that you are not to aim at impossibilities. What, after all, was your aim? To make some good effort, such as this. Well, then you have succeeded, even though your first purpose be not accomplished. The vainglorious man places his happiness in the actions of others. The sensualist finds it in his own sensations. The wise man realizes it in his own work. You have it in your power to form no opinion about this or that, and so to have peace of mind. Things material have no power to form our opinions for us. Accustom yourself to attend closely to what is said by others, and as far as possible to penetrate into the mind of the speaker. What profits not the swarm, profits not the bee. If the sailors revile their pilot, or the sick their physician, whom will they follow or obey? And how will the one secure safety to the crew, or the other health to the patients? How many who entered the world with me are already departed? To the jaundiced, honey seems bitter, and water is a thing of dread to those bitten by mad dogs. To boys a ball is a glorious thing, why then am I angry? Has error in the mind less power than little bile in the jaundice, or little poison in him who is bitten? No man can prevent you from living according to the plan of your nature, and nothing can befall you which is contrary to the plan of the nature of the universe. Consider what men are, whom they seek to please, what they expect to gain, and how they go about to compass their ends. Think how soon eternity will shroud all things, and how much is already shrouded. End of Book 6「Book 7 of the Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Yoni Santana The Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus by Marcus Aurelius Translated by George Crystal, 1888-1944 Book 7 What is vice? It is what you have often seen. In every instance of it, keep in mind that you have often seen the like before. Search up and down, and you will find sameness everywhere. Among the events which fill the history of ancient, middle, and present ages, among the things of which our cities and our households are full today, nothing is new, all is familiar and fleeting. How can the great principles of life become dead if the impressions which correspond to them be not extinguished? These impressions you may still rekindle. I can always form the proper opinion of this or that and, if so, why am I disturbed? What is external to my mind is of no consequence to it. Learn this, and you stand upright. You can always renew your life, see things again as once you saw them, and your life is made new again. Your vain concern for shows, for stage plays, for flocks and herds, your little combats are as bones cast for the contention of puppies, 
as baits dropped into a fish pond, as the toil of ants and the burden that they bear, as the scampering of frightened mice or the antics of puppets jerked by wires. It is then your duty amid all this to stand firm, kindly and not proud, yet to understand that a man's worth is just the worth of that which he pursues. In conversation we should give good heed to what is said, and in every enterprise we should attend to what is done. In the latter case, at once look to the end in view, and in the former note the meaning intended. Is my understanding sufficient for this business or not? If it be sufficient, I use it for the work in hand as an instrument given to me by nature. If it be not sufficient, I either give place to one better fitted for the achievement, or if for some reason this be not a proper course, I do it as best I can, taking the aid of those who, by directing my mind, can accomplish something fit and serviceable for the common good. For all that I do, whether by myself or with the help of others, should be directed solely towards what is fit and useful for the public service. How many of those who were once so mightily acclaimed are delivered up to oblivion, and how many of those who acclaimed them are dead and gone this many a day? Be not ashamed of taking assistance. It is laid upon you to do your part, as on a soldier when the wall is stormed. What then if you are lame and cannot scale the battlements alone, but can with another's help? Be not troubled about the future. You will come to it, if need be, with the same power to reason as you use upon your present business. All things are twined together in one sacred bond. Scarce is there one thing quite foreign to another. They are all ranged together, and leagued to form the same ordered whole. The universe compact of all things is one. Through all things runs one divinity. Being is one, and law, which is the reason common to all intelligent creatures. And truth is one as well, that is, if there be but one sort of perfection possible to all beings which are of the same nature and partake of the same rational power. Everything material is soon engulfed in the matter of the whole, and every active cause is swiftly resumed into the universal reason. The memory of all things is quickly buried in eternity. In the reasoning being to act according to nature is to act according to reason. Be upright either by nature or by correction. In an organic unity bodily members play the same part as reasoning beings among separate existences, since both are fitted for one joint operation. This thought will come home to you more vividly if you say often to yourself, I am a member of the mighty organism which is made up of reasoning beings. If instead of a member you say that you are merely a part you have not as yet attained to a heartfelt love of mankind. As yet you love not well-doing for its own sake alone, and you still perform your bare duty with no thought that you are your own benefactor by the deed. From the world without let what will affect whatever parts are subject to such affection. Let the part which suffers complain, if it will, of the suffering. But I, if I admit not that the hap is evil, remain uninjured. Not to admit it is surely in my power. Let any one say or do what he pleases. I must be a good man. It is just as gold or emeralds or purple might say continually. Let men do or say what they please. I must be an emerald and retain my lustre. The soul which rules you vexes not itself. It does not, for example, awake its own fears or arouse its own if desires. If another can raise grief or terror in it, let him do so. By its own impressions it will not be led into such emotions. Let the body take thought, if it can, for itself, lest it suffer anything and complain when it suffers. The soul, by means of which we experience fear and sorrow, and by means of which indeed we receive any impression of these, will admit no suffering. You cannot force it into any such opinion. The ruling part is in itself free from all dependence, unless it makes itself dependent. Similarly, it can be free from all disturbance and obstruction, if it does not disturb and obstruct itself. To have good fortune is to have a good spirit or a good mind. What do you hear, imagination? Be gone, I say. Even as you came, I have no need for you. You came, you say, after your ancient fashion. I'm not angry with you. Only be gone. 
Do you dread change? What can come without it? What can be pleasanter or more proper to the universal nature? Can you heat your bath unless wood undergoes a change? Can you be fed unless a change is wrought upon your food? Can any useful thing be done without changes? Do you not see, then, that this change also which is working in you is even such as these, and alike necessary to the nature of the universe? Through the substance of the universe, as through a torrent, all bodies are born. They are all of the same nature, and fellow workers with the whole, even as our several members are fellow workers with one another. How many a Chrysippus, how many a Socrates, how many an Epictetus hath the course of ages swallowed up? Let this thought be with you about every man and upon all occasions. For this alone I am concerned, that I do nothing that suits not the nature of man, nothing as man's nature would not have it, nothing that it wishes not yet. The time is at hand when you shall forget all things, and when all things shall forget you. It is man's special business to love even those who err, and to this love you attain if it is borne in upon you that even these sinners are your kin, and that they offend through ignorance and against their will. Remember also that in a little while both you and they must die. Remember before all things that they have not harmed you, for they have not made your soul worse than it was before. Presiding nature from the universal substance, as from wax, now forms a horse, now breaks it up again, making of its matter a tree, afterwards a man, and again something different. Each of these shapes subsists but for a little. Yet there is nothing dreadful for the chest in being taken to pieces, any more than the formerly was in being put together. A wrathful look is completely against nature. When the countenance is often thus deformed, its beauty dies, in the end is quenched for ever, and cannot be revived again. Seek to comprehend from this very fact that it is against reason, and if the sense of moral evil be gone as well, why should a man wish to remain alive? In a little space, nature, the supreme and universal ruler, will change all things that you behold. Out of their substance she will make other things, and others again out of the substance of these, so that the universe may be ever new. Whenever someone offends you, consider straight away how he has erred in his conceptions of good or evil. When you see where his error lies, you will pity him, and be neither surprised nor angry. Indeed, you yourself perhaps still wrongly count good the same things as he does, or things just like them. Your duty then is to forgive, and if you cease from these false ideas of good and bad, you will find it the easier to grant indulgence to him who is still mistaken. Dwell not on what you lack so much as on what you have already. Select the best of what you have, and consider how passionately you would have longed for it had it not been yours. Yet be watchful, lest by this joy in what you have accustom yourself to value it too highly, so that if it should fail, you would be distressed. Retire within yourself. The reasoning power that rules you naturally finds contentment with itself in just dealing, and in the calm which such dealing brings. Blot out imagination. Check the brutal impulses of the passions. Confine your energies to the present time. Observe clearly all that happens either to yourself or to another. Divide and analyze all objects into cause and matter. Take thought for your last hour. Let others' sin remain where the guilt lies. Apply your mind to what is said. Penetrate all happenings and the causes thereof. Rejoice yourself with simplicity, modesty, and indifference to all things that lie between good and bad. Love mankind and obey God. All things, says someone, go by law and order. But what if there be naught beyond the atoms? Even if that be so, suffice it to remember that all things, save very few, are swayed by law. Concerning death, if the universe be a concourse of atoms, death is a scattering of these. If it be an ordered unity, death is an extinction, or a translation to another state. Concerning pain, pain which cannot be borne brings us deliverance. Pain that lasts must needs be bearable. 
the mind can abstract itself from the body and the soul takes no hurt as to the parts which suffer by pain let them if they can make their own protest concerning glory consider the understanding of men what they shun and what they pursue and reflect that as heaps of sand have driven one upon another and the latter drifts bury and hide those that went before so too in life the former ages are soon buried by the next this from plato to the man who has true grandeur of mind and who contemplates all time and all being can human life appear a great matter impossible says the other can then such a one count death a thing of dread no indeed it is the saying of antisthenes that it is the part of a king to do good and reap reproach it is a shameful thing that the countenance should obey the mind should compose and order itself as the mind bids it while the mind cannot compose and order itself as it wills vain is all anger at external things for they regard it nothing give joy to us and the immortal gods for life is like the laden ear cut down and some must fall and some unreaped remain me and my children if the gods neglect it is for some good reason for i keep right and justice on my side weep not with them and still these throbs of woe from plato i would make him this just answer you are mistaken my friend to think that a man of any worth should count these chances of living and dying should he not rather in all he does consider simply whether he is acting justly or unjustly whether he is playing the part of a good man or a bad he says again in truth athenians the matter stands thus wheresoever a man has chosen his stand judging it the fittest for him or wheresoever is he stationed by his commander there i think he should stay at all hazards make no account of death or any other evil but dishonour again consider my friend whether the truly noble and the truly good be not something quite apart from saving and being saved the man who is a man indeed should not set his heart on living through a few more years of life nor should he make that the end of his desire rather he should commit the matter to the will of god assenting to the maxim which even women use that no man can elude his destiny and studying in addition how he may spend the life that remains to him for the best contemplate the courses of the stars as one should do that revolves along with them consider also without ceasing the changes of elements one into another speculations upon such thing cleanse away the filth of this earthly life it is a good thought of plato's that when we discourse of men we should look down as from a high place on all things earthly on herds and armies on husbandry and marriage on partings births and deaths on the tumults of the courts of justice on the desert places of the earth on the varied spectacle of savage nations on the feasting and lamentation on traffic on the medley of all things and the order which emerges from their contrariety consider the past and the revolutions of so many empires and thence you may foresee what shall happen hereafter it will be ever the same in all things nor can events leave the rhythm in which they are now moving wherefore it is much the same to view human life for forty as for a myriad of years what more is there to see to earth returns whatever sprang from earth but what's of heavenly seeds remounts to heaven this imports either the losing of a knot of atoms or a similar dispersion of immutable elements by meats and drinks and charms and magic arts death's course they would divert and thus escape the gale that blows from god we must endure toiling but not repining he is a better wrestler than you but not more public spirited more modest or better prepared for the accidents of fate not more gentle towards the shortcomings of his neighbours wherever we can act comfortably to the reason which is common to gods and men there we will have nothing to dread where we can profit by prosperous activity which proceeds in agreement with the constitution of our nature we need suspect no harm in all places and at all times you may devoutly accept your present fortune and deal in justice with your present company 
You may take pain to understand all arising imaginations that none may steal upon you before you comprehend them. Pry not into the souls of others, but rather look straight to the goal whither nature is leading you, whither the nature of the universe by external events, and whither your own nature by the tendency of your own action. Each being must perform the part for which it was created. Now all other beings are created for the sake of those among them which have reason, as all lower things exist for the sake of things superior to them, and reasoning beings were created for one another. The leading principle in man's nature, then, is the social spirit, and the second is the victory over the solicitations of the body, for it is proper to the workings of reason to set bounds to themselves and never to be overpowered by the calls of sense or by the stirrings of passion both of which are animal in their nature. The intellect claims to reign over these and never to be subjected to them, and rightly because it is equipped to command and use all the lower powers. The third element in the constitution of a reasoning being is caution against rashness and error. Let the soul go forth straight upon her way in the possession of these principles, and she stands seized of her full estate. Consider yourself as dead, your life is finished and past, Live what yet remains according to nature's law, as an overplus granted to you beyond your hope. Love that only which is your hap, which comes upon you as your part in fate's great spinning. What indeed can fit you better? Upon every accident keep in view those whom the like has happened. They stormed at the event, wandered and complained, but now where are they? They are gone forever. Why should you act the like part? Leave these unnatural commotions to fickle men who change and are changed. Yourself take thought of how you may make good use of such events. Good use for them there is. They will make matter for good actions. Let it be your sole effort and desire to gain your own approval in every action. And remember that the material objects of both that effort and of that desire are things indifferent. Look inward. Within is the fountain of good. Dig constantly, and it will ever well forth. Keep the body steady, without irregularity, whether in its motions or in its postures. For, as the soul shews itself in the countenance by a wise and graceful air, it should require the same expressive power of the whole body. But all this must be practiced without affectation. The art of life is more like that of the wrestler than of the dancer. For the wrestler must always be ready on his guard, and stand firm against the sudden, unforeseen efforts of his adversary. Consider constantly what manner of men they are whose approbation you desire, and what may be the character of their souls. Then you will neither accuse such as err unwillingly, nor need their commendation when you look into the springs of their opinions and their desires. Every soul, says Plato, parts unwillingly with the truth. You may say the same of justice, temperance, good nature, and every virtue. It is most necessary to keep this ever in mind, for if you do, you will be more kindly towards all men. In all pain, keep in mind that there is no baseness in it. It cannot harm the soul which guides you, nor destroy that soul as a reasoning or as a social force. In most pain, you may find help in the saying of Epicurus, that pain is neither unbearable nor everlasting. If you bear in mind its narrow limits and allow no additions from your imagination, remember that also we are fretted, though we see it not, by many things that which are of the same nature as pain, things such as drowsiness, excessive heat, want of appetite. When any of these things annoy you, say to yourself that you are giving in to pain. Look to it that you feel not towards the most inhuman of mankind, as they feel towards their fellows. Whence do we conclude that Telegis had not a brighter genius than Socrates? Tis not enough that Socrates died more gloriously, or argued more acutely with the sophists, or that he kept watch more patiently through a frosty night, or because, when ordered to arrest the innocent Salaminian, he judged it more noble to disobey, or because of any stately airs and graces he assumed in public, in which we may very justly refuse to believe, but assuming all this true, when we consider Socrates, we must ask what manner of soul he had. 
Could he find contentment in acting with justice towards men, and with piety towards the gods, neither vainly provoked by the vices of others, nor servilely flattering them in their ignorance, counting nothing strange that the ruler of the universe appointed, not sinking under anything as intolerable, and never yielding up his soul in surrender to the passions of the flesh? Nature has not so blended the soul with the body that it cannot fix its own bounds, and execute its own office by itself. It is very possible to be a god among men, and yet be recognized by none. Remember that always, and this as well, that happiness of life lies in very few things, and though you despair of becoming great in logic or in science, you need not despair of becoming a free man, full of modesty and unselfishness and of obedience unto God. It is in your power to live superior to all violence, and in the greatest calm of mind. Were all men to rail against you as they pleased, and though wild beasts were to tear asunder the wretched members of this fleshly mass which has grown with your growth, what is to hinder the soul amid all this form preserving itself in all tranquillity, in just judgments about surrounding things, and in ready use of whatever is cast in its way? judgment may say to accident, your real nature is this or that, though you appear otherwise in the eyes of men. Use may say to circumstance, I was looking for you. To me all that is present is ever matter for rational and social virtue, in sum for that art which is proper to both man and God. All that befalls is fit and familiar for the purpose of God or man. Nothing is either new or intractable but everything is well known and fit to work upon. It is the perfection of morals to spend each day as if it were the last of life, without excitement, without sloth, and without hypocrisy. The gods who are immortal are not vexed in that in a long eternity they must ever bear with the wickedness and the multitude of sinners. Nay, they even lavish on them all manner of loving care, but you who are presently to cease from being can forsooth endure no more though you are one of the sinners yourself. It is ridiculous that you flee not from the vice that is in yourself, as you have it in your power to do, but are still striving to flee from the vice in others, which you can never do. Whatever the rational and social faculty finds fit neither for rational nor for social ends, it justly ranks as inferior to itself. When you have done a kind action, another has benefited. Why do you, like the fools, require some third thing in addition, a reputation for benevolence, or a return for it? No man wearies of what brings him gain, and your gain lies in acting according to nature. Be not wary, therefore, of gaining by the act which gives others gain. Nature is set about making an ordered universe, and now either all that is follows a law of necessary consequence and connection, or we must admit that there is least rationality in the things which are most excellent, and which appear to be most special objects for the impulses of the universal mind. Remembrance of this will give you calmness on many an occasion. End of the seventh book. Book 8 of the Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alex Younger, Austin, Texas. You can read my blog at medium.com slash alexthejounger. The Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus by Marcus Aurelius. Translated by George Crystal, 1888-1944, Book 8 For repressing vainglory, it serves to remember that it is no longer in your power to make your whole life, even from your youth onwards, a life worthy of a philosopher. It is known to many, and you yourself know also, how far you are from wisdom. Confusion is upon you, and it now can be no easy matter for you to gain the reputation of a philosopher. The conditions of your life are against it. Now, therefore, as you see how the matter truly lies, put from you all thoughts of reputation among men, and let it suffice you to live so long as your nature wills, though that may be but a scanty remnant of a life. Study, therefore, the will of your nature, and be solicitous about nothing else. 
You've made many efforts and wandered much, but you have nowhere found happiness, not in syllogisms, not in riches, not in fame or pleasure, not in anything. Where then is it? In acting that part which human nature requires. How can you act that part? By holding principles as the source of your desires and actions. What principles? The principles of good and evil. That nothing is good for a man which does not make him just, temperate, courageous, and free. And that nothing can be evil which tends not to make him the contrary of all these. Upon every action, ask yourself, What is the effect of this for me? Shall I never repent of it? I shall presently be dead and all these things gone. What more should I desire if my present action is becoming to an intelligent and social being subject to the same law with God's? Alexander, Caesar, Pompey, what were they compared with Diogenes, Heraclitus, Socrates? These knew the nature of things, their causes, and their matter, and the minds within them were at one. As to the former, how many things they schemed for, and to how many were they enslaved? Men will go their own ways nonetheless, though you burst in protest. Before all things be not perturbed. Everything comes to pass as directed by universal nature, and in a little time you will be departed and gone, like Hadrianus and Augustus. Then scan closely the nature of what has befallen, remembering that it is your duty to be a good man. Do unflinchingly whatever man's nature requires, and speak as seems most just, yet in kindliness, modesty, and sincerity. It is nature's work to transfer what is now here into another place, to change things to carry them hence and set them elsewhere. All is change, yet is there no need to fear innovation, for all obey the laws of custom, and in equal measure all things are apportioned. For every nature it is sufficient that it goes on its way and prospers. The rational nature prospers while it assents to no false or uncertain opinion, while it directs its impulses to unselfish ends alone, while it aims its desires and aversions only to things within its power, and while it welcomes with contentment all that universal nature ordains, the nature of each of us is part of universal nature. As the leaf is part of the tree, the leaf, indeed, is part of an insensible and unreasoning system which can be obstructed in its workings, but human nature is part of that universal system which cannot be impeded, and which is intelligent and just. Hence is meted out suitably to all our proper portions of time, of matter, of active principle, of powers, and of events. Yet look not to find that each several thing corresponds exactly with any other. Consider rather the whole nature and circumstances of the one, and compare them with the whole of the other. You lack leisure for reading, but leisure to repress all insolence you do not lack. You have leisure to keep yourself superior to pleasure and pain and vain glory, to restrain all anger against the ungrateful, nay, even to lavish loving care upon them. Let no man any more hear you railing on the life of the court, nay, revile it not to your own hearing. Repentance is self-reproving, because we have neglected something useful. Whatever is good must be useful in some sort, and worthy of the care of a good and honorable man. Now such a man could never repent of neglecting some opportunity of pleasure. Pleasure, then, is neither useful nor good. Of each thing, ask, What is this in itself and by its constitution? What is its substance or matter? What is its cause? What is its business in the universe? How long shall it endure? When you are reluctant to be roused from sleep, remember that it accords with your constitution and with human nature to perform social actions. Sleep is common to us with the brutes. Now whatever accords with the nature of each species must be most proper, most fitting, and most delightful to it. Constantly, and if possible, on every occasion, apply to your imaginations the methods of physics, ethics, and dialectic. Whomsoever you meet, say straight away to yourself, What are this man's principles of good and evil? For if he holds this or that doctrine concerning pleasure and pain, and the causes thereof concerning glory and infamy, death and life, it will seem to me neither strange nor wondrous that this or that should be his conduct. I shall bear in mind that he has no choice but to act so. 
Remember that, as tis folly to be surprised that a fig tree bears figs, so is it equal folly to be surprised that the universe produces those things of which it was ever fruitful. It is folly in a physician to be surprised that a man has fallen into a fever, or in a pilot that the wind has turned against him. Remember that, to change your course and to follow any man who can set you right is no compromise to your freedom. The act is your own, performed on your own impulse and judgment, and according to your own understanding. If the doing of this be in your own power, why do it thus? If it be in another's, whom do you accuse? The atoms or the gods? To accuse either is a piece of madness. Therefore, accuse no one. Set right, if you can, the cause of error. If you cannot, correct the result at least. If even that be impossible, what purpose can your accusations serve? Nothing should be done without a purpose. That which dies falls not out of the universe. If then, it stays here. Here too it suffers a change, and is resolved into those elements of which the world and you too consist. These also are changed, and murmur not. The horse, the vine, all things are formed for some purpose. Where is the wonder? Even the sun saves. I was formed for a certain work, and similarly the other gods. For what end are you formed? For pleasure? Look if your soul can endure this thought. Nature has an aim in all things in the end, and surcease of them no less than in their beginning and continuance. It is even as a man casting a ball. Where then is the good for the ball in its rising? Where the harm in its dropping? Where even is the harm when it has fallen down? Where is the bubble's good while it holds together? Where is the evil when it's broken? So it is with the lamp which now burns and anon goes out. Turn out the inner side of this body, and view it as it is. What shall it become when it grows old, or sickly, or decayed? The praiser and the praise, the rememberer and the remembered, are of short continuance, and that in a mere corner of this narrow region where, narrow though it be, men cannot live in concord, no, not even with themselves, and yet the whole world is but a point. Attend well to what is before you, whether it be a principle, an act, or a word. This, your suffering, is well merited, for you would rather become good tomorrow than good today. Am I doing aught? Let me do it in a spirit of service to mankind. Does aught befall me? I accept it and refer it to the gods, the universal source from which come all things in the chain of consequence. The accompaniments of bathing, oil, sweat, filth, foul water, how nauseous are they all? Even so is every part of life, and everything that meets us. Lucilla buried Varus, and soon followed him to the grave. Secunda saw the death of Maximus, and soon herself died. Epitinkanus buried Diotimus, and then Epitinkanus was buried. Antoninus mourned Faustina and thereafter Antoninus was mourned. Sealer buried Hadrian, and then Sealer was buried. All go the same way. The cunning men who foretold the fates of others, or who swell with pride, where are they now? Where are these keen wits? Cherax and Demetrius the Platonist, and Eudaimon and their like. All were for a day, and are long dead and gone. Some scarce remembered even for a little after death. Some turned to fables, some faded even from the memory of tales. Wherefore remember this, either the poor mixture which is you must be dispersed, or the faint breath of life must be quenched or removed and brought into another place. The joy of man is to do his proper business, and his proper business is to be kindly to his fellows, to rise above the stirrings of sense, to be critical of every plausible imagination, and to contemplate universal nature and all her consequences. We have all of us three relations. The first, to the manifold occasions of our state. The second, to the supreme divine cause from which proceed all things unto all men. The third, to those with whom we live. Pain is either an evil to the body, and then let the body so declare it, or an evil to the soul. But the soul can maintain her own serenity and calm, and refuse to conceive pain as an evil. All judgment, intention, desire, and aversion 
are within the soul, to which no evil can ascend. Blot out false imaginations, and say often to yourself, It is now in my power to preserve my soul free from all wickedness, all lust, all confusion or disturbance. And then, as I truly discern the nature of things, I can use them all in due proportion. Be ever mindful of this power which nature has given you. Speak, whether in the Senate or elsewhere, with dignity rather than elegance, and let your words ever be sound and virtuous. The court of Augustus, his wife, his daughter, his descendants, and his ancestors, his sister and Agrippa, his kinsmen, familiars, and friends, Arius and Mycenas, his physicians and his flamens. Death has them all. Think next of the death of a whole house, such as Pompey's, and of what we meet sometimes inscribed on tombs. He was the last of his race. Last of all, consider the solicitude of the ancestors of such men to leave the succession of their own posterity. Yet, at the end, one must come the last, and with him dies all that house. Order your life in its single acts, so that if each, as far as may be, attains its end, it will suffice. In this, no one can hinder you. But you say, may not something external withstand me? Nothing can keep you from justice, temperance, and wisdom. Yet perhaps some other activity of mine may be obstructed. True, but by yielding to this impediment, and by turning with calmness to that which is in your power, you may happen on another course of action equally suited to the ordered life of which we are speaking. Receive the gifts of fortune without pride, and part with them without reluctance. You have seen a hand, a foot, or a head cut off from the rest of the body, and lying dead at a distance from it. Even such as these as he make himself, so far as he can, who repines at what befalls, who severs himself from his fellow men, or who does any selfish deed. Are you cast forth from the natural unity? Nature made you to be a part of the whole, but you have cut yourself off from it. Yet here there is a glorious provision that you may reunite yourself if you will. In no other case has God granted you the privilege of reunion to a separate or severed part. Yet behold the goodness and bounty with which God hath honored mankind. He first puts it in their power not to be severed from this unity, and then, even when they are thus severed, he suffers them to return once more, to take their places as parts of the whole, and to grow one with it again. Universal nature, as she has imparted to each rational being almost all its faculties and powers, has given to us this one in particular among them. As nature converts to her use, ranges in destined order, and makes part of herself all that withstands or opposes her, so each rational being can make every impediment in his way a proper matter for himself to act upon, and can use it for his guiding purpose, whatever it may be. Do not confound yourself by considering the whole of life and by dwelling upon the multitude of greatness of the pains and troubles to which you may probably be exposed. As each presents itself, ask yourself, is there anything intolerable and insufferable in this? You will be ashamed to own it. And then recollect that it is neither the past nor the future that can oppress you, but always the present only. And the ills of the present will be much diminished if you restrict it within its own proper bounds, and take your soul to task if it cannot bear up even against this one thing. Does Panthea or Pergamus now sit mourning at the tomb of Varus? or Chabrius, or Diotimus, at the tomb of Hadrian? Absurd! And if they were still mourning, could their masters be sensible of it? Or if they were sensible of it, would it give them any pleasure? Or if they were pleased, could the mourners live forever? Was it not fate that they should grow old men and women, and then die? What, then, would become of the illustrious dead when these faithful souls were gone? And all this toil for a vile body, not but blood and corruption. If you have keen sight, says the philosopher, use it in discretion and in wisdom. In the constitution of the rational being, I discern no virtue made to restrain justice, but I see continence made to restrain sensual pleasure. Take away your opinion about the things that seem to give you pain, and you stand yourself upon the surest ground. 
What is that self? It is reason. I am not reason, you say. So be it. Then let not reason pain itself, but leave any part of you which suffers to its own opinions of the pain. Obstruction of any sense is an evil for the animal nature. So is the obstruction of any of its impulses. There are other kinds of obstruction which are evil for the nature of plants, for the rational nature in like manner. Therefore, obstruction of the understanding is evil. Apply all this to yourself. Do pain and pleasure affect you? Let the senses look to it. Does anything hinder your designs? If you have designed without the proper reservation, that in itself is an evil for you as a reasoning being. If you designed under the general reservation, you are neither hurt nor hindered. No man can hinder from the proper work of the mind. Nor fire, nor sword, nor tyrant, nor calumny can reach it. Nor any other thing. When it has become even as a sphere, complete and perfect within itself. I have no right to vex myself, who never yet willingly vexed anyone. Each man has his own pleasure. Mine lies in having my ruling part sound, without aversion to any man, or to any hap that may befall mankind. Yet let me look on all things with kindly eyes. Let me accept and use them all according to their worth. See that you secure the benefit of the present time. They who pursue a fame which is to live after them, reflect not that posterity will be men even as are those who vex them now, and that they too will be mortal. And afterwards, what shall signify to you the clatter of their voices, or the opinions they shall entertain about you? Take me up and cast me where you will. I shall have my own divinity within me serene, that is, satisfied while its every state and action is according to the law of its proper constitution. Is any event of such account that my soul should suffer for it or be the worse, that my soul should become abject and prostrate as a mean suppliant, or should I be affrighted? Shall you find anything that is worth all this? Nothing can befall a man which is not human fortune. Nothing can happen to an ox, to a vine, or to a stone, which is not the natural destiny of their species. If then, that alone can befall anything which is usual and natural, what cause is there for indignation? Universal nature hath brought nothing upon you which you cannot bear. When you are grieved about anything external, it is not the thing itself which afflicts you, but your judgment about it. This judgment it is in your power to efface. If you are grieved about anything in your own disposition, who can prevent you from correcting your principles of life? If you are grieved because you do not set about some work which seems to you sound and virtuous, go about it effectually, rather than grieve that is undone. But some superior force withstands, then grieve not, for the fault of the omission lies not in you. You say, but life is not worth living with this undone. Quit life then in the same kindly spirit as though you had done it, and with good will even to those who withstand you. Remember that the governing part becomes invincible when, collected into itself, it is satisfied in refusing to do what it would not, even when its resistance is unreasonable. What then will it be, after due deliberation, it has fixed its judgment according to reason? The soul, thus free from passions, is a strong fort, nor can a man find any stronger to which he can fly and become henceforth invincible. The man who has not discerned this is ignorant. He who has discerned this and flies not thither is miserable. Pronounce no more to yourself than what appearances directly declare. It is told to you that so-and-so has spoken ill of you. This alone is told you, and not that you are hurt. I see my child is sick. This alone I see. I do not see that he is in danger. Dwell thus upon first appearances. Add nothing to them from within, and no harm befalls you. Or rather, add the recognition that all is a part of the world's lot. Is the gourd bitter? Put it from you. Are there thorns in the way? Walk aside. That is enough. Do not add, why were such things brought into the world? The naturalist would laugh at you, just as would a carpenter or a shoemaker, if you began fault-finding because you saw shavings and parings from their work strewn about the workshop. These craftsmen have places where they can throw away this rubbish, but universal nature has no such place outside her sphere.
Yet the wonder of her art is that, having confined herself within certain bounds, she transforms into herself all things within her scope which seem to be corrupting or waxing old and useless, and out of them she makes other new forms, so that she neither needs matter from without nor place where to cast out her refuse. She is satisfied with her own space, her own material, and her own art. Be not languid in action, nor confused in conversation, nor vague in your opinions. Let there be no sudden contractions or forth sallings of your soul. In your life be not overhurried. Men slay you, cut you to pieces, pursue you with curses. What has this to do with your soul remaining pure, prudent, temperate, and just? What if someone, standing by a clear, sweet fountain, should reproach it? It would not cease to send forth its refreshing waters. Should he throw into it mud or dung, it will speedily scatter them and wash them away, and be in no wise stained thereby. How, then, shall you get this perpetual living fount within you? If you reserve yourself unto liberty every hour you live, in a spirit of calmness, simplicity, and modesty. He who knows not what the universe is, knows not what is his place therein. He who knows not for what end it was created, knows not himself, and knows not the world. He who is deficient in either of these parts of knowledge, could not even say for what end he himself was created. What sort of man, then, does he appear to you, who pursues the applause, or dreads the anger, of those who know neither where, nor what they are? Do you wish to be praised by a man who curses himself thrice within an hour? Can you desire to please one who is not pleased with himself? Can he be pleased with himself who repents of almost everything he does? No longer be content to breathe in harmony with the air which surrounds you, but set about feeling in sympathy with the intelligence which embraces all things. For the power of that intelligence is no less diffused and no less pervasive for all who can draw it in than it is the virtue of the air for him who can breathe it. There is no universal wickedness to hurt the world, and the particular wickedness of any individual hurts not another. It hurts himself alone, and even he has this gracious privilege that, as soon as he desires it, he may be free from it altogether. To my will, the will of another is as indifferent as his poor breath and flesh. And how much soever we were formed for the sake of each other, yet the governing part of each of us has its own proper power. Otherwise, the vice of another might become my own misery. God thought fit that this should not be, lest it should be in another's power to make me unhappy. The sun seems to us diffused everywhere, pervasive of all things, yet never exhausted. This diffusion is a sort of extension, and hence the Greek word for rays is thought to be derived. You may observe the nature of a ray if you see it entering through some small hole into a darkened chamber. Its direction is straight, and is reflected around when it falls upon any solid body, which shuts it off from the air beyond. There it stands, and does not slip or fall. Now such should be the flow and diffusion of the understanding, never exhausted, always extending, not violently or furiously dashing against the obstacles that meet it, nor falling aside, but resting there, and illuminating whatever will receive it. That which will not transmit the light does but deprive itself of radiance. He who dreads death dreads either the extinction of all sense or the experience of a new one. If all sense be extinguished, there can be no sense of evil. If a different sort of sense be acquired, you become a different creature and do not cease to live. Men were created the one for the other. Teach them better then, or bear with them. Mind moves in one way, and an arrow in another. The mind, when cautiously proceeding, or when casting round in deliberation about what to pursue, is nevertheless carried onward, straight towards its proper mark. Penetrate into the governing part of others, and also allow others to enter into your own. End of Book 8《Book Nine of the Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, 
by Marcus Aurelius. Translated by George Crystal, 1888 to 1944. Book 9. He who does injustice commits impiety. For since universal nature has formed the rational animals for one another, each to be useful to the other according to his merit, and never hurtful, he who transgresses this, her will, is clearly guilty of impiety against the most ancient and venerable of the gods. He who lies sins against the same divinity. For the nature of the whole is the nature of all things which exist, and things which exist are akin to all that has come to be. Nature indeed is called truth, and is the first cause of all truths. He then that lies willingly is guilty of impiety, in so far as by deceiving he works injury. And he also who lies unwillingly, in so far as he is out of tune with universal nature, and in so far as he works disorder in the universe by fighting against its design. He is at war with nature who sets himself against the truth. He has neglected the means with which nature furnished him, and cannot now distinguish false from true. He too who pursues pleasure is good, and shuns pain as evil is guilty of impiety. Such a one must needs frequently blame the common nature for unseemly awards of fortune to bad and to good men. For the bad often enjoy pleasures and possess the means to attain them, and the good often meet with pain and with what causes pain. Again, he who dreads pain must sometimes dread a thing which will make part of the world order, and this is impious. And he who pursues pleasure will not abstain from injustice, and this is clear impiety. In those things to which the common nature is indifferent, for she had not made both, were she not indifferent to either, he who would follow nature ought in this also to be of like mind with her, and show the like indifference. And whoever is not indifferent to pain and pleasure, life and death, glory and ignominy, all of which universal nature uses indifferently, is clearly impious. By nature using them indifferently, I mean that they befall indifferently all beings which exist, and ensue upon others in the great chain of consequence which began in the primal impulse of providence. Providence, in pursuance of this impulse, and starting from a definite beginning, set about this fair structure of the universe when she had conceived the plan of all that was to be, and appointed the distinct powers which were to produce the several substances, changes, and successions. It were the more desirable lot to depart from among men, unacquainted with falsehood, hypocrisy, luxury, or vanity. The next choice were to expire when cloyed with these vices. Have you then chosen rather to abide in evil, or has experience not yet persuaded you to fly from amidst the plague? For a corruption of the mind is far more a plague than any pestilential distemper or change in the surrounding air we breathe. The one is pestilence to animals as animals but the other to men as men. Despise not death, but receive it well content as one of the things which nature wills. For even as it is to be young, to be old, to grow up, to be full grown, even as it is to breed teeth and beard and to grow gray, to beget, to go with child, to be delivered, and to undergo all the effects of nature which life seasons brings, such is it also to be dissolved in death. It becomes not, therefore, a man of wisdom to be careless, or impatient, or ostentatiously contemptuous about death. He should rather await its coming as one of the operations of nature. Even as now you await the season when the child of your wife's body shall issue into the light, await the hour when your soul shall fall out of these, its teguments. If you wish for the common sort of comfort, here is a thought which goes to the heart. You will be completely resigned to death if you consider the things you are about to leave, and the morals of that confused crowd from which your soul is to be disengaged. It is far from right to be offended with them. It is even your duty to have a tender care for them, and to bear with them mildly. Yet remember that the parting, when it comes, will not be with men who think as you think. For the only thing which, if it might be, could hold you back and detain you in life, would be to live with those who had reached the same principles of life as you. But, as it is, you, seeing how great is the fatigue and toil arising from the jarring courses of those who live together, may cry, Haste death, 
lest I too should forget myself. The sinner sins against himself. The wrongdoer wrongs himself by making himself evil. Men are often unjust by omissions as well as by actions. Be satisfied with your present opinion if certain, with your present course of action if social, with your present mood if well pleased with all that comes upon you from without. Wipe out impression, stay impulse, quench desire, and keep the governing part master of itself. The soul distributed among the irrational animals is one. Rational beings, on the other hand, partake of one reasoning intelligence. Even so, there is one earth to all things earthy, and for all of us who are endowed with sight and breath, there is one light by which to see, one air to breathe. All things that share a common quality are strongly drawn to that which is of their own kind. The earthy tends towards the earth, fluids flow together, aerial bodies likewise, and naught but force prevents their confluence. Fire rises upward on account of the elemental fire, and it is so ready to join in kindling with all the fire that is here, that any matter pretty dry is easily set on fire, because that which hinders its kindling is the weaker element in its composition. Thus also, then, whatever partakes of the common intellectual nature, hastens in like manner, or even more markedly, towards that which is akin to it. For the more it excels other natures, the stronger is its tendency to mix with and adhere to its kind. Accordingly, among irrational creatures we find swarms of bees, herds of cattle, nurture of the young, and love of a sort. For even in animals there is a soul, and in the more noble animals a mutual attraction is to be found at work, such as does not exist in plants, or stones, or wood. Among the rational animals again there are societies and friendships, families and assemblies, and, in war, treaties and truces. Among beings still more excellent there subsists, though they be placed far asunder, a certain kind of union as among the stars. Thus ascent in the scale can produce a sympathy even in things that are widely distant. But mark what happens among us. It is only intellectual beings who forget the social concern for one another, and the mutual tendency to union. Here alone the social confluence is not seen. Yet are they environed and held by it, though they strive to escape, and nature always prevails. Observe, and you will see my meaning. For sooner may one find some earthy thing which joins with nothing earthy, than a man severed and separate from all men. Man, God, and the universe all bear fruit, and each in their own season. Custom indeed has appropriated the expression to vines and the like, but that is nothing. Reason has its fruit both for all men and for itself, and produces just such other things as reason itself is. If you can, teach men better. If not, remember that the virtue of charity was given you to be used in such a case. Nay, the gods are patient with them, and even aid them in their pursuit of some things such as health, wealth, and glory. So gracious are they. You may be so too. Who hinders you? Bear toil and pain not as if wretched under it, nor as courting pity or admiration. Wish for one thing only, always to act or to refrain as social wisdom requires. Today I have escaped from all trouble, or rather I have cast out all trouble from me, for it was not without but within in my own opinions. All things are, in our experience, common, in their continuance but for a day, and in their matter, sordid. All things now are as they were in the times of those we have buried. Things stand without, by themselves, neither knowing or declaring aught to us concerning themselves. What is it, then, that pronounces upon them? The ruling part. It is not in passive feeling, but in action, that the good and evil of the rational animal form for society consists. Similarly, his virtue or vice lies not in feeling, but in action. To the stone thrown up, it is no evil to fall, no good to rise. Penetrate the souls of men, and you will see what judges you fear, and how they sit in judgment on themselves. All things are in change. You yourself are under continual transmutation, and in some sort corruption. So is the whole universe. Another sin you must leave with himself. 
the ceasing of any action the extinction of any keen desire or of any opinion is as it were a death to them this is no evil think again of the ages of your life childhood youth manhood old age each change of these was a death is there anything to dread here think now of your life as it was first under your grandfather then under your mother then under your father and as you find there many other alterations changes and endings ask yourself is there anything to dread here thus neither is there anything to dread in the cessation ending and change of your whole life make swift appeal to your own ruling part to that of the universe and to his who has offended you to your own that you may make it a mind disposed to justice to that of the universe that you may remember of what you are a part and to his that you may know whether he has acted in ignorance or by design and that you may also reflect that he is your kinsman you yourself are a part of a social system necessary to complete the whole accordingly let your every action be a similar part of the social life and if any action has not its reference either immediate or distant to the common good as its end this action disorders your life and frustrates its unity it is sedition like that of the man who in a commonwealth does all in his power to sever himself from the general harmony and concord children's quarrels child's play poor spirits carrying about dead corpses such is our life the mask of the dead is intelligible by comparison go to the quality of the cause abstract it from the material and contemplate it by itself determine then the time how long at furthest this thing of this peculiar quality can naturally subsist you have endured innumerable sufferings by not being satisfied with your own ruling part when it does the things which it was formed to do enough then of that when another reproaches or hates you or utters anything to that purpose go to his soul enter in there and look what manner of man he is you will see that you need not trouble yourself to make him think well or ill of you yet you should be kindly towards such men for they are by nature your friends and the gods too aid them in all ways by dreams by oracles and even in the things about which they are most eager the course of things in the world is ever the same a continual rotation up and down from age to age either the universal mind exerts itself in every particular event in which case you must accept what comes immediately from it or it has exerted itself once and for all and as a result all things go on forever in a necessary chain of consequence or again atoms and indivisible particles are the origin of all things in fine if there be a god all is well and if there be only chance you at least need not act by chance the earth will presently cover us all and then this earth will itself be changed into other forms and these again into others and so on without end and if any one considers how swiftly those changes and transmutations roll on like one wave upon another he will despise all things mortal the universal cause is like a winter torrent it sweeps all along with it how very little worth are those poor creatures who pretend to understand affairs of state and imagine they unite in themselves the statesman and the philosopher the frothy fools do you o oh man that which nature now requires of you set about it if you have the means and look not around you to see if any be taking notice neither hope to realize plato's republic be satisfied if the smallest thing go well consider even such an event as no small matter for who can change the opinions of men and without change of opinion what is their state but a slavery under which they groan while they pretend to obey come now speak of alexander philip and demetrius of phalerum they know best whether they understood what the common nature required of them and whether they trained themselves accordingly but if they designed only to play the tragic hero no one has condemned me to do the like the work of philosophy is simple and modest lead me not astray in pursuit of a vainglorious stateliness look down as from some eminence upon the innumerable herds the countless solemn festivals the voyaging of every sort in tempests and in calms the different states of those who come into life enter upon life's associations and leave it in the end 
Consider, too, the life which others have lived formerly, the life they will live after you, and the life that barbarous peoples are now living. How many of these know not even your name? How many will quickly forget it? How many are there who perhaps praise you now, but will shortly blame you? Reflect, then, that neither is surviving fame a thing of value, nor present glory, nor anything at all. Let nothing do to a cause outside yourself disturb your calm. In the workings of the active principle within you let there be justice. That is a bent of will and a course of action which have social good as their one end, and so are suited to your nature. You can suppress many of the superfluous troubles which beset you, for they lie wholly in your own opinion. By this you will give ample room and ease to your life. You may compass this end by comprehending the whole universe in your judgment, by contemplating eternity, and by reflecting on the swift changes of individual things, thinking how short is the time from their birth to their dissolution, how immense the space of ages before that birth, how equally infinite the eternity which shall succeed that dissolution. All things that you see will quickly perish and those who behold them perishing are very soon themselves to die. And he who dies oldest will be in like case with him who dies before his time. What manner of souls have these men? What is the end of their striving, and on what accounts do they love and honor? Imagine their souls naked before you. When they fancy that their censures hurt, or their praises profit us, how great is their self-conceit! Loss is not but change. In change is the joy of universal nature, and by her all things are ordered well. From the beginning of ages they have been shaped alike, and to all eternity they will be the same. How then can you say that all things have been, and ever will be, evil? That among so many gods there has been found no power to rectify, but that the universe is condemned to endure the burden of never-ending ill? How corrupt is the material substance of every thing? Water, dust, bones, and foulness. Again, marble is but the concrete humor of the earth, gold and silver its heavy dregs. Our garments are but hair, the purple dye, blood. All else is of a like nature. Breath, too, is just the same, ever changing from this to that. Enough of this wretched life, enough of repining and apish trifling. Why are you disturbed? Are any of these troubles new? What excites you so? Is it the cause? Then view it well. Is it the matter? View it also well. Besides these there is nothing. Wherefore at last act with more simplicity and goodness towards the gods. Whether you look on this spectacle for a hundred years or for three, it is the same. If he has done wrong, the evil is with him, and perhaps too he has not done wrong. Either all things proceed from one source of intelligence and come together in one body, in which case the part must not complain of what comes about for the benefit of the whole, or all is atoms, and there is nothing else but confused mixture and dissipation. Why then are you disturbed? Say to your soul, Thou art dead, thou art rotten, thou hast turned beast, joined the herd, and dost feed along with them. Either the gods have power, or they have none. If they have no power, why do you pray? If they have power, why do you not choose to pray to them for power neither to fear, nor to desire, nor to be grieved over any of these external things rather than for their presence or their absence? Surely if the gods can aid man at all, they can aid him in this. But perhaps you will say the gods have put this in my own power. Then is it not better to use that which is in your own power and preserve your liberty, than to set your heart on what is beyond your power and become an abject slave. And who has told you that the gods aid us not in these things, also which are in our power? Begin to pray about them, and you will see. One man prays, May I possess that woman. Do you pray, May I have no wish to possess her? Another prays, May I be delivered from so and so. Pray you, May I not need to be delivered from him. A third cries, May I not lose my child? Let your prayer be, May I not fear to lose him? In fine, turn your prayers this way and observe what comes of it. Epicurus says, In my sickness my conversations were not about the diseases of this poor body, 
nor did I speak of any such things to those who came to me. I continued to discourse as before on the principles of natural philosophy, and was chiefly intent on the problem of how the mind, though it partakes in the violent commotions of the flesh, might remain undisturbed and keep guard on its own proper excellence. I permitted not the physicians, he continues, to magnify their office, and vaunt themselves as if they were doing something of great moment. But my life continued pleasant and happy. What he did then in sickness, do you also if ye fall ill, or suffer any other misfortune. Never to depart from your philosophy whatever befalls you, never to join in the folly of the vulgar and the ignorant, is a maxim common to all the schools. Give your mind only to the business now in hand, and to the means whereby it is to be accomplished. When you are offended by the shamelessness of any man, straightway ask yourself, Can the world exist without shameless men? It cannot. Therefore do not demand what is impossible. Your enemy also is one of these shameless people who must needs be in the universe. Have the same question also at hand when you are shocked at craft, or perfidy, or any other sin. For while you remember that it is impossible that the class should not exist, you will be more charitable to each particular individual. It is useful also to have this reflection ready. What virtue has nature given to man wherewith to combat this fault? Against unreason she has given meekness as an antidote. Against another weakness, another power. You are also at full liberty to set right one who has wandered. Now every wrongdoer is missing his proper aim and has gone astray. And then, in what are you injured? You will find that none of those at whom you are exasperated have done anything whereby your intellectual part was like to be the worse. Now anything which can really harm or hurt you has its subsistence there and there alone. And wherein is it strange or evil that the man untaught acts after his kind? Look if you ought not rather to blame yourself for not having laid your account with his being guilty of such faults. Your reason gave you the means to conclude that it was probable that he would do this wrong. You forgot, and yet wonder that he has done it. But above all, when you are blaming any one for faithlessness or ingratitude, turn to yourself. The fault lies manifestly with you if you trusted that a man of such a disposition could keep faith, or if, when you granted the favor, you did not grant it without ulterior views, and on the principle that the complete and immediate reward of your action lay in the doing of it. What would you more, when you have done a man a kindness? Is it not enough for you that you have acted in this according to your nature? Do you ask a reward for it? It is as if the eye were to ask a reward for seeing, or the feet for walking. For just as these parts are formed for a certain purpose, which they fulfill according to their proper structure, they attain their proper end. So man, formed by nature to do kindness to his fellows, whenever he acts kindly or in any other way works for the common good, has fulfilled the purpose of his creation, and has possession of what is his own. End of Book Nine Recording by Philip Gould